How many of you would like a nice cool day, about 73 degrees with a nice breeze? Yeah. All right, wait till tomorrow. <laughs> it's coming, I promise. So, as I shared uh, the other day uh, with you, when I came to, to camp, when I came to Chehi Summer School of Music, I had no idea what God was going to do in my life. And I came, as I shared, more for some social reasons than spiritual reasons or even music. Uh, but God worked in my life in all of those areas while I was here. But one of the things that, that God did in my life while I was here was to help me to see Him more clearly and to have a greater understanding of, of who Jesus was. And so today, our, our word for today is revelation. All right, and, and what I have been praying for you today and praying for myself and for, for all of us is that through God's Word and by the power of the Holy Spirit that God would give us a revelation of Himself and of His Son, Jesus. That, that we would see Him maybe in a way that we've never seen Him before. That we would know Him in a way that we've never known Him before. And that we would by knowing that and seeing that and experience that, be strengthened and challenged and stretched and encouraged. Now, I want us to think about this word revelation. So I, I looked up the, the definition, some of the meanings uh, of revelation. So it's a surprising or previously unknown fact, especially one that's made known in a dramatic way. It can be the making known of something that was previously secret or unknown. That's sort of how Paul uses the word mystery, right? Uh, that there's now something been revealed that was previously not known. He uses that about the gospel, about Jesus. It's, it's also used to emphasize the surprising or remarkable quality of someone or something or the divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to the human existence in this world. And so I've been praying that we together would have a revelation, a revelation of our knowledge of Christ. Now, the passage we're going to look at this morning is at the end of chapter 1 of Ephesians, and we're going to have a, a very neat privilege this morning because we're going to get to encounter one of the prayers that Paul prayed over the believers in Ephesus. And I believe it's a prayer that he would pray over you and I. I believe he'd pray for anyone who knew Jesus Christ. And, you know, it's a really encouraging thing when someone tells you that they're praying for you. How many would say it's encouraging when someone tells you? All right, it's, when someone says, I'm praying for you, that's really encouraging. And sometimes, not only do people tell us that they're praying for us, that they might even tell us what they're praying for. And that's that's very encouraging. You know, sometimes God prompts us just to pray for someone very specifically. And, and sometimes we share that with them, and that's encouraging. But you know what's even more encouraging than being told you're being prayed for, or even someone sharing what they're praying for? It's actually sometimes hearing someone pray for you. Have you ever experienced that? Just the blessing and the power that comes from someone praying over your life? I know there's been many moments in my life where I needed that and God provided that. You know, four years ago I went through a very difficult season and transition in ministry and there were some really hard days, and, and there were moments where, you know, at just the right moment, God would send a friend, or, or someone called me, I had one of my friends called me up, and he's like, let me just pray for you, and he prayed for me over the phone, and, and I, I didn't even know he could pray that well, I was really surprised, actually, but it was such a tremendous blessing. Well, Paul is going to pray over the church, and, and while he's not physically with them because he's in prison, I'm no doubt, as, as they re read this letter together in the church, there's no, I'm sure that they could hear Paul's voice praying over them. And so I want you to hear today this prayer that Paul prayed over the church. But before we do that, may I pray for you? Would you join me? Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege that we have to be together this morning. And Father, I pray today for every student and counselor and faculty and staff member. Father, I pray for myself and I pray that we might have a revelation today in our knowledge of you. I pray that you'd reveal yourself. I pray that you'd stretch us and grow us. And Father, I pray that you'd be glorified. Father, I thank you for every person here this morning. I know that you love them, that you sent your son Jesus to die for them, that they are the object of your grace and affection and mercy and goodness. And I pray today that in your mercy and your goodness and your grace, you'd reveal yourself to each of us in a fresh way so that you would be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Ephesians 1, let's begin uh, with verses 15 through 17. Paul says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. And I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Now, one of the things that I've noticed about my prayer life and, and even the prayers of others that I hear them pray is that we often pray for circumstances to change, right? We, we pray for healing of sickness. We pray for a situation that we want God to work in and we want to see His power move in. And, and that is good. And we should do that and we should continue to do that. But one of the things that I've noticed in the Bible and particularly in Paul's prayers is that he often does not pray for people's situation or circumstances to change. And he instead prays for something to transform on the inside of them. And, and it's pretty amazing because Paul was writing from prison. right? If anybody wanted their circumstances to change, like it should be Paul. And he's writing to a church that, that was going through difficult things. And Paul didn't pray that everything would just suddenly get better for them or that everything would be easier, that they wouldn't have any difficulty or they wouldn't have any problems. But instead, he prays something else. So let's, let's look at, at what he prays because I think he's ultimately praying that they would have a revelation, right? A revelation of Jesus in their lives. So he, notice a few things though first before he prays for them. He says, ever since I heard of your strong faith. Now, that means that they were continuing to trust God. You see, faith in Jesus is not a, a one-time event. It's not just that we trust Him in faith to save us and then we just go on. No, we, we are required by God to continue to trust Him and to grow in our faith and our walk with Him. And he says, you have strong faith. And he's like, I, I am proud of you for that. I'm, I'm thankful for that. And then he says, you, I'm thankful for your love for God's people everywhere. You know, we sang about that the other night. In sing time, right? That they'll know we're Christians by our what? Love. By our love. You think everybody knows that we're Christians because of our love? You know, I, I don't know about your situation, but I know that we don't always do a really good job of that. And yet Jesus said that there was nothing more important than loving Him and loving people. That really there's only three things that, that are really, really, really important in life, which is to love Him completely and totally, to love your neighbor, and to love your enemy. And we don't always do a good job of that. And I think one of the reasons we don't is because we haven't had a deep encounter with Jesus ourselves. And we haven't had frequent encounters with His intense love for us. Because you see, you're never going to be able to love others until you yourself understand and experience and encounter the deep love of Jesus for you. And so Paul commended them though for their, their faith and their love and then he prayed for them. And look at just a few of the things that he, he prayed for. All right? He prays for, he prays for uh, spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. An understanding. What's he praying for? An understanding that can only be unlocked by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? He was praying for something supernatural for them. He says, I want you to have a supernatural understanding of God. Right? And thankfully, today we have God's Word. Right? God's revelation to us. And through God's Word, we get to know God and we get to know His plan and His ways. But we can't do that just just by reading it, right? We need power to understand it and to apply it to our life to, to really grasp it. And that power comes from the Holy Spirit, God who lives in you. And so Paul, he prays for spiritual wisdom that they would, they would understand and, and know deep spiritual wisdom. And then he prays for insight. And really he's praying for a revelation, a revealing of a deeper knowledge, a deeper experience, a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. And what he meant for their lives. And so Paul's praying for this, this revelation. He says, I'm, I'm praying that you'd have spiritual wisdom and that you'd have insight. Why? Notice what he says. So that you might what? Grow. Right? God wants you to grow. He wants you to grow up in Him, in, in knowledge of Him, in obedience to Him, in love for Him. And that comes by understanding Him more. He wants us to have a revelation. Not just that they would be smarter, not just that they would have better theology, not just that they could have a, 
a more head knowledge of God. He, he wanted them to have a heart knowledge of God too. He wanted them to actually know God, to know Him, to experience Him, to encounter Him. Not just knowing about Him, right, and it's good to learn about God, but God doesn't want you to just know about Him, right? He's invited you into a living relationship with Him through His Son. And when you're in a relationship, you don't just want to memorize facts and information about the other person, do you? Right? Would that be weird? Would it be weird if all I did was memorize facts and information about my wife, but I never got to know her heart, that I never sought to understand her, that I never cared about what she thought or felt? Right? Right. If all I knew about her was facts and information, we wouldn't say that would be much of a relationship. Right? And God doesn't just want you to know facts and information about Him. He wants you to know Him. And He wants you to know His heart and His ways. And so Paul prayed that they would grow in their knowledge of Him in a deep and experiential way. And think about, let's just step back and think about how extraordinarily amazing this is. That the God of the universe, right, the one who, who spoke creation into existence, the one who sustains all of the universe by his power, and we have no clue how big the universe is, right? It, it goes on for as, as far as we can know, light years and light years and light years, which I, I mean, my brain, which is very small, right, cannot, uh, you were, could laugh there if you want to, <laughs> thank you. I can't wrap my mind around how vast the universe is, but yet the Bible says that God measures the universe by the span of His hand. Right? This God who sustains the entire universe by His power has made a way for you to know Him and to experience relationship with Him. And Paul's praying that, that these believers would understand this incredible reality that they had access to. And, and I think Paul prayed this prayer because it was out of his own experience that he had come to know Jesus so deeply and so personally that he wanted them to have what he had. How many of you have ever, have ever, ever eaten something that was just so good it was just so amazing that you just wanted everyone else to be able to experience it or try it. All right? I think we can all have that, that moment. The, the other night I had a chance to, and this picture does not do it justice, but that's strawberry rhubarb pie and really good vanilla ice cream. All right? And there's a little place just down the road where they sell this stuff. And every now and then I just have to go have a slice of that pie. Right? And I wish I could take all of you with me, right? But I could not afford that. So... <laughs> But it's so good, so I'd highly recommend it. You know, when, when we've experienced something good, we just, we want to share it. We want other people to know it. And that's exactly how Paul felt about these believers. He wanted them to know what he had. And in fact, in his letter to the church in Philippi, he said this. He said, yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for His sake I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage. And garbage is a bad translation there, right? It, it's, really, it, it's, it, it's really much worse than just garbage. So that I could gain Christ. He says, I count it as refuge, refuse, as, as literally as dung, all right? And that's what he says. He says, everything in my life is, is as of so little value compared to knowing Christ. You know, and I, and I wish that I could say that's always true of my life, or that's always been true. But I know that I want to have a deeper passion for Jesus, and I want that for you too. Right? Paul says, I I've, come to, I've come to taste and see how good the Lord is and how incredible my relationship with Jesus is. And he's like, there's just nothing, nothing more important than that. And so he says, everything, everything in comparing to knowing Jesus is just of such little value. And so Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus that, that they would experience, that they would taste what he tasted. In fact, in Philippians 3.10, just a, another verse down there, he says, I want to know Christ. He says, that's, that's what I live for. I live to know Christ. Right? And he says, because knowing him, it's so much more extraordinary than you could imagine or understand. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. He says, I want to know him and I want to know his power and I wish he had stopped right there. Because then he said what? That I might suffer with him. He says, I want to suffer with him. Right? Paul knew Jesus so deeply he says, even if that means that I have to, and he was living this out as he wrote it. It wasn't just like theoretical. He was suffering for Jesus. Paul suffered greatly for Christ. 
right? Beaten and shipwrecked and thrown into prison. So many times he suffered for Christ. But he says, I want to suffer for Christ, sharing in his death. It's such a privilege, he said, to suffer for Christ. Wow, how could he say that? It's because he had tasted and seen and known the deep love and grace and goodness of God. And he had a growing knowledge of who Jesus was in his life. And he wanted everyone else to know that. So look at what he continues to pray. He says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he has called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. He wanted them, he says, I'm praying that the the light will come on for you. Right? As we're talking about this revelation, he says, I'm praying that your heart would be flooded with light, that, that you would see for yourself how incredible this hope is that you have in Christ. He knew that their lives were, were difficult. Right? He knew their situation was hard. And so he says, I, I want you to see that even though your situation is hard, and even though life is difficult, and even though there are things that happen that you don't understand, I want you to, to be flooded with light so that you can understand, so that you can grasp this hope that you have in Christ that He's given to you. And then He says, you're His rich and glorious inheritance. That's such a beautiful picture, right? Because not only do we get to inherit God's kingdom one day in His glory, but He says we also in a way are His inheritance. It's such a beautiful picture of God's love for us. And so He wanted their hearts to be flooded with light. How many of you have, have ever walked into a dark room not knowing what was there? Anybody? Kind of a scary experience, right? But then when you flip on the light, you immediately what? You see everything that was there. Now, when it was dark, was it still there? Yes. But you couldn't what? You couldn't see it. Right? And, and that's what Paul's praying for the church. He's, he's saying, these glorious realities are yours, but, but we don't always see them. Right? We don't always experience them. And, and, and it could be for a lot of reasons. And you know, we talked about yesterday about how we all go through stuff right? Stuff happens to us, things that shouldn't happen to us, right? We make mistakes, we have failures, we have struggles, right? We go through difficult seasons. You might be there, you might have a struggle with anxiety, you might have a struggle with depression, you might have a habit that you can't get rid of and you hate it and you're ashamed, right? There's a lot of things that might be going on in our lives that cause us to not see this incredible hope that we have to cause us to not to understand the incredible love that God has for us. And so Paul is praying that their hearts would be open, that they would, their eyes would be open, that they would see the light of Christ and they would understand it. And then he makes one more request. Look at verses 19 through 20. Paul says, I pray also that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. For this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. You know, there are moments in life where life feels like it's just too much, doesn't it? Right? Maybe you've been there, right? Where, where we, we, we enter seasons of, of life where our circumstances just sometimes leaving us a place where we just think, I can't do this. Right? Have you been there? I, I can't do this. I, I can't handle this. This is too much. I can't deal with it. Right? If, if you've ever been there, I want you, you are not alone. And you're not a failure. And you're not a bad Christian, right? We all have been there. There are moments in life where we just say, I can't do this. But that's when God wants us to remember, right? He wants us to remember who Jesus is. He wants us to remember what he's done for us and who he is in his life. And he wants us to understand that he has power available to us because when you can't, God can. When you can't handle it, God can. And God lives in you through the Holy Spirit and he is with you and he won't let you go. And if you will understand that his power is available to you, he will make a way for you to get through. He won't let you go. And if you'll trust him, it may be hard and it may be difficult and it may be painful, but he will see you 
through. He is faithful. And Paul says, I pray that you'll understand, that you'll grasp this power that's available to us. He says it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Resurrection power is living in you. It's there. And Paul says, I just want the light to come on so that you'll see this power and you'll know about this power and that you'll walk in this power. And listen, Paul knew, like again, Paul's not writing in theory. He lived this. Right? We know that he had what he described as a thorn in his flesh. He says, a messenger of Satan that was sent to torment me. And, and he says that, that, that he prayed and begged God to take it away. He says, three times, I begged God to take this thing out of my life. And we don't know what it was, right? But we know that it was physical. It was, he said it was a thorn in his flesh. Have you ever had a thorn in your flesh, right? How many say it was a painful experience, right? It hurt. And Paul says, I have a, a thorn in my flesh. I'm going through something that's physical, that's hard, that's painful, Right? He says, but he says it's not just, not just physical. He says it's spiritual too. Right? He says a messenger of Satan. Right? So he was, it was a physical thing, but they were spiritual. Listen, Satan knows when, where we're weak. He knows when we're, we're hurting. And he will attack and he will try to discourage you. He will try to dis, dis, just absolutely make you not want to trust God. He'll cause you to doubt, to question. That's what he does. He's the deceiver. And so Paul says there was a messenger of Satan. He said he was sent to torment me. And that word in the original language literally means to strike with a fist. Now, I won't ask you this question, but maybe some of us have been struck by a fist before, right? You know, I, I was a few times, and I think the first time was in elementary school, right? And it was my mouth that, that got me there, right? And I got struck by a fist. It was painful, Right? But I didn't want to tell my parents that I had gotten struck by a fist because I didn't want to tell them what I had said. Right? They got me struck by the fist, so I just said I bumped into something, you know, made up some sort of lie. Um, feels good to get that confessed now. Feel better. <laughs> Whatever Paul was going through was incredibly hard. Hard enough that a man who rarely prayed for circumstances to change begged God for his circumstance to change. But God didn't take it away. But what God did for him was something even greater. He gave him sufficient grace to handle what he was going through. Right? Sufficient means filled with unfailing strength. And Paul says, God's grace is sufficient for my weakness. Right? He says, God's grace was sufficient. It was enough to strengthen me. It was enough to sustain me. It was enough to see me through. And I want you to know this morning that God's grace is enough. And I want you to have a revelation of, of who He is and what His power can do in your life because I know life is hard, right? And I know life will continue to be hard. I wish I could promise you that it won't be, right? And like, the dad part of me would do anything to take away your hurt, right? The dad part of me would do anything to keep you from going through a hard time. Like we want to protect our kids. But God in his wisdom, knows that sometimes he has to allow circumstances that we don't understand to accomplish purposes that we could never imagine. But when we do, he is not unloving, he is not unkind, and he is not distant, and he is not unsympathetic, and he is not uncaring. He is with us, and he cares, and he sees your hurt, and he sees your pain, and he wants to strengthen you, and sustain you, and to comfort you, and to hold you through those things. So Paul finishes up with some encouragement for them, right? After he prays for them, he wants to lift their eyes and their hearts to who God is. And so he, he gives this sort of glorious benediction. And look, verse 20 says, Now he, Jesus, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, right? And, and Paul lived in a time where there was a wicked and evil government reigning, right? This government was going to, had him imprisoned and was eventually going to execute him. But he says it, it really doesn't matter because he says there's no authority, there's no power, there's no leader or anything else. He says not only in this world but also in the world to come. He says there's nothing that Jesus isn't greater than and you can trust him. He says God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him the head over all things for the benefit of the church. Right? And the church is his body. You, me, we together are part of his church. Right, we gather in, in local churches and local gatherings, but there's only one church. We're going to get to that next week. There's one body, one family, and that's made up of everyone who knows Jesus. And he says, he says he gave, he has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, and the church is his body. 
It's made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. He wanted the church to know who Jesus was. He wanted them to see how glorious he was, how powerful he was, how mighty he was. And, and I've, I've been praying that God would do for you what he did for me when I was a student here. I've been praying that God would do for me what he did for me a long time ago, that I too would have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is, right? That I would know him in a deeper way. And I believe God's brought all of you here for a great purpose. He wants to grow you. He wants to stretch you. He wants to sharpen the talents that you have in music. That's why we make you practice two hours a day. That's why we push you, right? Because God has given you talents and abilities and he's brought you here to grow them and to be sharpened and be strengthened and to learn and to grow to glorify him. But I also believe he's brought you here so that you might know him more, right? That, that a coming apart from regular life and technology and all those things. How many of you say it's kind of nice, isn't it? Right? It, so some of you are going to get rid of your phone when you go home, right? Not quite, right? But it's good to just get away. And sometimes when we do that, we can see God in ways that we've not seen him before. We can know him in ways that we haven't known him before. And so I just want to ask you this morning, do you need a fresh touch from God? Do you need a fresh vision of who he is? And if that's the case, I believe that God wants to do that for you. Maybe something's obscured your view of God. Right? Maybe, something, maybe there's something that, that just needs to be dealt with that, that in having a revelation of Jesus that part of that is saying maybe there's something in my life that I need to deal with. Maybe it's a habit that I've been hanging on to and, and God's calling me to deal with that. Maybe it's just that, you know, I, if I'm honest, I've just kind of drifted in my love for Jesus and my passion for Him and I just want to Him to do a fresh work in my life, a fresh touch, fresh grace. Maybe you just simply say, you know what, things are good, but I just want to know him more. I, I want to know him more. I want to have a heart like Paul's heart. I, I really want to get there. And listen, God's not going to just zap you and you're not going to just get there all in one moment. God grows us through, through steps and process. But if you'd say, God, my desire is to, to be like Paul, to know you more. And I want to know your power. Even if it means suffering, I want to know you. I want to know you. If that's your prayer today, I, I want to just encourage you to tell God that. Would you bow your heads this morning as we just stop for a moment and reflect on what it is that God might be wanting to speak to our heart this morning. My prayer for you is that you might have a breakthrough today in an area of your life. I don't know what that area is. God knows what it is. I'm praying that he'll reveal that to you. But if there's something in your life that, that God's wanting to deal with that's keeping you from seeing Jesus and living for him, let him deal with that. Even if it means an uncomfortable conversation or having to confess that to someone or getting help, listen, let God do that. Right? But for all of us, I'm praying that there just would be a supernatural revealing in our hearts and our minds of who Jesus is because we need that. Life's hard. And so I just want you to see Jesus fresh today. There, I love that old hymn that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And the first verse starts out, it says, O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. That's what I want for you. That abundant life, that free life that only Jesus can give you. If you don't have that, Jesus is offering it to you today. Let me, let me pray for you. Father, we need to see your son Jesus more clearly. And Father, so many times the circumstances of our life, the stuff we go through, or even our own sin, or our, our own failings, Father, sometimes obscure our view of, of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that, that, that you might open our eyes spiritually, that you might open our hearts, that you might flood us with light today, that we would see you fresh and new and in a greater way, that we would grow in our knowledge of you, our understanding of you, that we'd have spiritual wisdom to understand you and understand your power and your grace and your goodness in our life. And, Father, that we would truly learn to hunger for you, that we would desire to know Jesus more. Father, so that we might live lives that honor and glorify and please you. Father, I pray for each person here this morning. I don't know everything about them. I don't know everything that's going on in their life. But Father, I just pray that you'd remind them today how much you love them. And that you'd reveal your son Jesus to them in a fresh way. And that you might strengthen and encourage and empower them for your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.